Uh, greetings to all and thank you for participating today in this virtual debate. We sincerely appreciate your participation, regardless of your location. The Center for African Justice, Peace and Human Rights is the organizer of today's event. I now extend an invitation to Ms. Anupama, the Center's keynote speaker for today, to give a welcoming speech on behalf of Ms. Sophia Uvo and the Center's management. She will introduce the organization and its work. Ms. Anupama, please. Yeah, thank you, Tatiana. Hello, everyone. I welcome you all to this auspicious virtual debate title, Can International Criminal Courts and Tribunals Effectively Prosecute the Sexual Violence Perpetrated Against Child Soldiers by Members of Their Group Without Clashing with IHL, International Humanitarian Law, provision. Depending on where you are watching us from, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all viewers worldwide. On behalf of the board and management of the Center for African Justice, Peace, and Human Rights, I welcome you all to the auspicious virtual debate. The debate is hosted by the Center for African Justice, Peace, and Human Rights. For those of you who are not aware, the Center for African Justice, Peace and Human Rights is a non-profit foundation based in The Hague, the Netherlands, led by the founder, chairperson, Ms. Sophia Ugu, secretary, Ms. Adesola Adboy, and the treasurer, Ms. Takin Sens. The center addresses problems concerning, concerning the rules of law, sexual violence against the male gender, women's empowerment and the rights to quality education in the African region. The center's team comprises of a range of legal professionals, volunteers and interns who all are enthusiastic and passionate about the international justice, sustainable peace and securing human rights. Sexual violence against the male gender team. The CAJPHR sexual violence team, as indicated by the name, focuses on the issue of sexual violence perpetrated against the male gender during the conflict. SV team seeks to build upon, contribute to international efforts to identify the occurrences of such violence and to facilitate efforts targeted at the eradicating such violence. Though it is acknowledged that this type of violence is expressed by all genders. Males constitute the focus of our work as a, in practice they are often overlooked as victims. Thus, in to help achieve our mission of breaking the existing silence and to create awareness, the SV team conducts research, publishes magazines, hosts debates, conferences and webinars on the subject to increase recognition and lift barriers in the relation to assess assessing justice. In this regard, the sexual violence team's projects aim to provide tools to legal professionals and law students, enabling them to enhance their knowledge of international law. To this end, the sexual violence team is proud to officially launch this series of debate events on topics about international law with an emphasis on international criminal law, which we hope to host two, three times a year. This exciting venture is the result of the center's desire to actively engage with young law students and educators to highlight issues that are relevant to Africa and the world at large within the field of international criminal law. Today, this edition of the debate taking place will be between a team of debaters made up of law students from the University of Io in Nigeria who will be facing off against their counterparts from two universities in Netherlands. The debate will be presided over by judges who have legal backgrounds and expertise in the field of international law. As you may already know, participating in this debate provides a fantastic opportunity for law students to further develop their legal research, advocacy, and team working skills. Connections and networks with the students from other universities around the world. 
Considering these benefits, I wish to take this opportunity to thank our coach, Professor Noella Quinet, for taking out time for her busy schedule to train the debaters and prepare them for this event. To conclude, the sexual violence team is very delighted to welcome you all to the second edition of the Center for African Justice, Peace and Human Rights virtual debate. This debate is being live streamed via YouTube to a global audience. Please feel free to cheers the debaters via YouTube live chat and let us know where you are tuning from today. Thank you all once again for your presence, support, and participation in the debate. I will now hand over the platform to my colleague, Tatiana, who will be the moderating this event. Have a wonderful debate. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Anupamu, for that warm welcome and the brief introduction into the workings of the organization and specifically the sexual violence team. As you all know, or I hope you know, we're here to watch the legal debate with the title Can International Criminal Courts and Tribunals Effectively Prosecute the Sexual Violence Perpetrated Against Child soldier, Soldiers by Members of Their Own Group Without Clashing with the International Humanitarian Law Provisions? The judges for today's debate are five exceptional lawyers and academics knowledgeable in international law. On the panel today, we have Judge Dr. Afrin Nar, who will be chairing the debate. Judge Dr. Afrin Nar will also be accompanied by Judge Ms. Irene Divalvasoni, Judge Barrister Ms. Chikananna, Judge Ms. Chidi Grace Obeke, and Judge Ms. Saska Ayes. And on behalf of the Center for African Justice, I have to say that we are very honored to have you judge this debate today. And we're thanking you for taking your time to be present with us here at today's debate. Our today's debate timekeeper is Rafaela. She is a member of the center's capacity building team and she'll be responsible for tracking the speaker's times. Today's speakers for the Center for African Justice proposition team are Ms. Vishnu Priyakotlo, Mr. Felix Kamira, and Ms. Emily Brown. Accordingly, the speakers from the Faculty of Law of University of Uyo in Nigeria, which are representing opposition team today, are Mr. Victor Isang Umana, Mr. Wokumfond Friday Ntia, and Mr. Anifiog Ini Ukpong. I would be remiss not to acknowledge the coach that ensured that the teams are prepared for this event today. Ms. Noel Kuvinbe, a professor of international law in the UK and Germany with over 20 years experience in armed conflicts with the focus on protection of women and children. Thank you so much, Ms. Kuvinbe. Although your face will not be seen on the screen, your work will shine through the debaters here today. A warm welcome to all the participants of the debate and the best of luck to both teams. Before we get into the debate, let me explain the structure of the event. I will call Judge Dr. Afrim Nar to introduce the rules of procedure for the debate and to explain how the participants will be judged. Then we'll move immediately to the debate, starting with the first speaker of the proposition. The debate will end at approximately 5.30 p.m. Amsterdam time, and after that, the judges will have around 15 minutes to deliberate. When the time is over, the judges will return to us, announce the winners, and give some feedback to the participants. In case if the judges are finished with the decision sooner, they're welcome to come back to the se session right after they finish. After that, I will give the closing remarks before we call it a day. I hope the structure of the event is clear to everyone. So let me welcome Judge Dr. Afrim Nar to conduct the debate. Please. Excuse me, uh, Dr. Afrim Nar, you're muted, unfortunately. Do you hear me now? Yes, thank you. 
Yeah, sorry about that. I earlier uh, unmuted myself, but I got back again. Well, um, as you've all received your um, the criteria for as a, for judging this debate, I don't want I will not waste much of your time. But we'll be look we'll be looking at how clear you present your argument, the the structure from beginning to the end, how effective you include. Um, logic and uh, effectiveness in terms of what we, we will be looking at your credibility, authority, how you present them. Then the relevance in terms of international criminal law, how much you use the law, how much you use jurisprudence, the interpretation of the law. We'll be looking at how you apply legal precedence. And of course, for the presentation itself, the structure Oh, sorry, your language and persuasiveness, how, how you are able to persuade the audience. They will be looking at also factors that can take down your grades. For instance, your time management is, is not accurate if you lack ketse for your opponents. And then whether you understand the topic and you are hitting the right uh, notes and you are not reading from scripts. Overall, we are going to form an impression and then we deliberate, and then uh, and then we we well we score the, the 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 debate. It is not an exam, so relax. We are going to do it as flexible and free as possible. This is not um it's a it's an opportunity for you to practice, as the notes said to you already. So I give the the the, the opportunity for you to now to start, and we'll be we'll be with you. Thank you, Dr. Afrim Nar. And I think now it's time to proceed to the debate itself. And I'm welcoming Ms. Vishnu, who will be the first speaker of the proposition team to open today's debate. Ms. Vishnu, please. Thank you, Tatiana. Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm a legal researcher. I'm project management manager of the SV team in the, at the center. I represent myself as the first speaker of the proposition team along with two other colleagues, Felix and Emily. Let me give a little introduction to the debate topic that armed conflicts affect everyone, including children. In fact, some of them even take part in the conflict. To address the debate question about the prosecution of sexual violence against child soldiers by members of their own group in the international criminal courts and tribunals, and its compat in compatibility with the international humanitarian law, it's important to consider several key international law regimes, namely international criminal law, international humanitarian law, and international human rights law, notably relating to the rights of the child. The relevant sources are not only the treaties, such as the Geneva Conventions and the additional protocols, the Rome Statute and the Convention of the Rights of the Child and its optional protocol uh, in the involvement of children in the armed conflict, but also customary international law and ju jurisprudence of the international criminal courts and tribunals. First and foremost, we contend that international tribunals and courts can effectively prosecute sexual violence against child soldiers committed by members of the same group without clashing the rules of international humanitarian law by virtue of the broad scope of their mandate which is enshrined in the Rome Statute and also specialized international tribunals. My first argument goes in such a way that beyond the collective purpose of international justice, these legal instruments establish distinct organizations at the forefront of the prosecution of major international crimes. International law, particularly as enforced through the International Criminal Court, deals with the prosecution of serious international crimes including war crimes, genocide, and crimes against humanity. Sexual violence, including against child soldiers, can be prosecuted under these statutes. To be more specific, Article 82B.22.6 encompasses war crime as a war crime of sexual violence, which is a serious international crime and thus falls within the jurisdiction of the international criminal courts and tribunals. 
now i conclude my first argument let me move on to my second argument which focuses on the conventional doctrine of the international humanitarian law which is a set of rules that regulates the relationships between the members of the opposing parties to an armed conflict uh, is the primary focus of this branch of law rather than those that occur within the same armed group doctrinally speaking war crimes would not at least in theory include acts perpetrated by combatants of one party to the conflict against members of their own armed forces which may leave room for prosecutorial competence of international criminal courts and tribunals furthermore the distinction between the international and non international armed conflicts matters significantly in the context of ihl and prosecution of crimes including sexual violence against child soldiers ihl has traditionally distinguished between these two types of conflicts with different rules and protections applying to each however for the purpose of prosecuting war crimes including sexual violence article under article 8 of the rome statute the icc does not differentiate on the nature of the conflict building upon this premise nonetheless we argue that it would be contradictory to the very institutional foundation of international courts and tribunals if an effective prosecution by international courts was a synonym of a clash with a branch of international law which is meant to guide its practice such as ihl article 82 of the rome statute provides a legal basis for the for the international criminal courts and tribunals to prosecute the sexual violence perpetrated against the child soldiers of one's own group to the armed conflict moreover in terms of avoiding clashes with ihl provisions note that the prosecution of crimes including sexual violence against child soldiers within their own groups would generally not conflict with ihl rather it would reinforce the principles of ihl by holding perpetrators accountable for violations by prosecuting sexual violence against child soldiers in accordance with the principles of fair trial and due process international criminal courts and tribunals reinforce the special protections afforded to children under ihl moreover we would underline the principle of complementarity in the rome statute which encourages states to prosecute crimes domestically this emphasis is further reinforced by the additional protocol 1 and geneva conventions which obliges states to prosecute crimes on a national level this concludes my second argument and let me move on to my third argument which contains that it is possible that treaty grounded international justice regimes such as the icc may eliminate the imposition of status based prerequisite considering the crimes specific definitions recent jurisprudential developments have supported this claim through entaganda case which examined customary international law in accordance with accepted ihl rules including prohibitions on sexual violence in armed conflict international uh, criminal tribunals and courts can effectively prosecute sexual violence against child soldiers perpetrated by members of the same group without contravening the international humanitarian law furthermore the entaganda case can consider the status criteria under ihl it examines that whether the rome statute adopted adopted a state, status criterion from ihl making it a substantive component of sexual offenses ihl is partially a status based treaty offering different levels of protection to different categories of persons affected by armed conflict such as combatants non combatants prisoners of war and civilians however certain protections under ihl apply universally irrespective of their status for example prohibitions against torture inhuman treatment infliction infliction of suffering and injury which are forbidden according to the principle of humanity or universal which reflects the principle of humanitarian foundation of ihl sexual violence is recognized as a crime under international law irrespective of the victim status including crime, crimes committed against child soldiers by members of their own group instead international legal 
instruments such as the uh, recognize such acts as serious violations of the international law prosecutable and as war crimes which is enumerated under articles of the rome statute here i quote article 8 to b 22 that stipulates committing rape sexual slavery enforced prostitution forced pregnancy as defined in article 7 paragraph 2f forced sterilization or any other form of sexual violence also constituting a grave breach of the geneva conventions and article 8 to e6 also stipulates committing rape, sexual slavery, enforced prostitution, forced pregnancy as defined in Article 7, Paragraph 2F, enforced sterilization and any other form of sexual violence also constituting a serious violation of common Article 3 to the four Geneva Conventions. Here I end the quote. In conclusion, while ICC and other international criminal tribunals operate within the framework of IHL, the prosecution of sexual violence is grounded in a broader interpretation of international law that transcends the traditional IHL distinctions. The approach emphasizes the protection of victims over the status-based categories typical of IHL in addressing the grave humanitarian concerns associated with such acts. The conviction of Entaganda by ICC marked a pivotal moment in the expansion of the scope of war crimes of sexual violence this aspect underscores, underscores the ICC's commitment to addressing the full spectrum of abuses suffered by the jail soldiers of the same group, not limiting to their recruitment and use in hostilities, but also extending to sexual abuse and exploitation. The Office of the Prosecutor in Antaganda case detailed two charges related to sex crimes, alleging rape and sexual slavery reported recruitedly within the Union des Patriotes Congolais and Forces Patriotes Poor Law Liberation du Congo, in short form UPC, FPLC, by members of the same group. Pre the pre-trial chamber, trial chamber and appeals chamber elucidated the law pertaining to intra-party sexual offences. These uh, chambers exhibited a sophisticated comprehension of international humanitarian law principles and the practical implementation in various war crime situations. Now I conclude my arguments and my uh, and the second speaker of our team will continue his line of arguments. Thank you. Over to Tatiana. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vishnu, for such an insightful initial speech. And mm -hmm. now I would like to call Mr. Victor Umano as the first speaker of the opposition team to give the opening speech for their team. Mr. Victor, please. Good evening, the moderator, panel of judges, accurate timekeeper, my fellow co-debaters, and of course, to the general audience viewing this debate. My name is Victor Isang Umana, and alongside me are my colleagues, Anefiok Ini and Wang Fon Intia. We are members of the opposition team here to strongly disagree with the motion which says that can the International Criminal Court and Tribunals effectively prosecute the sexual violence perpetrated against child soldiers by members of the same group without clashing with the provisions of IHL. We are solidly of the view that if the International Criminal Court and Tribunals prosecute the sexual violence perpetrated against child soldiers by members of the same group, such an action would clash with the provisions of IHL and would breed a haven ground for the misconception and the misuse of the language of IHL. I shall begin our argument by relying on the assertion that only IHL is to be used for prosecuting war crimes and nothing else. To do this, I shall establish the meaning, the rationale, and the principles of IHL. IHL is a branch of public international law that is applicable in times of armed conflict meaning that IHL is only applicable where there is resort to armed conflict. A pertinent question to ask, therefore, is what is an armed conflict? An armed conflict has been defined by the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia in the Tadis case to mean where the, that it exists. It is infallible to state that the rationale of IHL flows from this definition because IHL does not seek to stop or prevent war. 
unnecessary sufferings and hardship caused as a result of the war. The origin of IHL can be traced to a certain Swiss humanitarian named Henri Dunard, who encountered the horrors he witnessed at the Battle of Solferino in Northern Italy. It is recorded that after he witnessed this war, he began an international humanitarian movement, establishment of the International Committee of the Red Cross, known as and is now a foremost organization in the world today, known for its provision and protection of the principles of international humanitarian law. The exploits of the founder of the ICRC further led to the adoption of the Geneva and the Hague Conventions, seeking to protect with emphasis wounded soldiers, soldiers who wish to no longer be part of war and have surrendered, prisoners of war and civilians. Concurrently, over the years, due to the development of IHL, states have been able to effectively prosecute the sexual the war crimes, war crimes committed by victims and people who also perpetrate armed conflict. War crimes are serious violations of IHL. However, not all violations of IHL are war crimes. Only some are. However, every grave violation of IHL is codified under Article 8 of the Rome Statute. The Rome Statute also establishes the International Criminal Court, known as the ICC, and has given the ICC the jurisdiction over crimes against humanity, genocide, war crimes, and crimes of aggression. Our argument this far seeks to establish the following facts. That one, war crimes contain other Article 8 of the Rome Statute are directly linked to IHL. Secondly, that the war crimes, that crimes of sexual violence contained in Article 8 of the Rome Statute are found in Article 8, Sub 2, Paragraph B, 22, and Article 8, Sub 2, Paragraph B, Paragraph E, 6, for non-international armed conflict. We seek to further re-emphasize that the provisions of Article 8 of the Rome Statute seek to protect wounded soldiers, soldiers who have surrendered and wish to no longer be part of war, IHL has no business with them because it will clash with the fundamental principles of IHL to prosecute for such. Now, a child soldier is any boy or girl under the age of 18 that is directly associated with an armed group or an armed force. To further strengthen our argument on this, we are standing solely on the principles of IHL, which are the principle of distinction, military necessity and proportionality to state that it is fallacious and vexatious to state to say that war crimes can be prosecuted against members of the same group where they are against members of the same group for example in an armed conflict while it is a crime while a, a combatant can be attacked a non combatant a civilian cannot be attacked also we seek to establish that child soldiers participate directly in hostilities. This is because they engage in acts which are, which because they engage in acts which seem to support one party and cause aggressive harm to another party. Example, for the, for the opposition to feel that child soldiers, that the, the sexual violence perpetrated against child soldiers by members of the same group can be prosecuted. We seek to ask this pertinent question. Imagine in a scenario where members of the same group destroy their own monumental buildings or civilian facilities in the name of trying to carry out excessive civilian deaths. Would such an action mean that those members will be prosecuted under IHL? This does not tally at all, and we disagree with such an argument. We are vehemently of the view that the reasoning of the prosecution in the Intergandas case should be heavily criticized. Because the dubious effect of submitting that sexual violence perpetrated against child soldiers by members of the same group would mean that members of the same group are meant to uphold all the core principles of IHL. And we ask ourselves the question, does IHL protect the members of the same group? We disagree solely with that kind of assertion. We disagree. To that extent, the trial and appeal chamber
differentiation and identification in IHL redundant. So I concluded, or we conclude, that the crime of sexual violence perpetrated against child soldiers by members of the same group should not in any way be prosecuted under IHL or, any, or by any other tribunal, because to do so would not just clash with the provisions of IHL, but would create an er erroneous assumption as to the conception and application of IHL in times of armed conflict. At this juncture, I shall be deferring proceedings to my co-speaker to further activate arguments, uh, arguments in this debate. Thank you so much, Victor, for your emotional argument and your reasoning. I would now like to call on Mr. Felix, the second speaker of the proposition team, to continue the position of his team. Mr. Felix, please. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, members of the panel. My name is Felix Camila, legal researcher at the Center for African Justice, Peace and Human Rights. And I'll continue as the second speaker on the team of the proposition of this debate. <clears throat> we are going to illustrate to what extent the Ntaganda case is instrumental in, up in upholding our proposed argument and concentrating the effective prosecution of intraparty sexual offenses by delving in detail into three reasoning formulated by the pre-trial chamber, the trial chamber, and the appeals chamber, respectively. In deciding whether to confer, to con, to con, in deciding whether to con, sorry, sorry, team, let me, one, moment, one moment. In, 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 in deciding whether to confirm the accusation of the pre-trial chamber, use a careful reasoning to process to process to ensure responsibility for sexual abuse against especially against especially uh, uh, in deciding whether to confirm the accusation the pretrial chamber used a uh, careful reasoning to process uh, to to ensure responsibility for sexual abuse against especially vulnerable people while affording uniformity between the primary and the secondary regulations of international humanitarian law it means the case that being part of an armed organization does not always entail that an individual is also protected and IHL. Furthermore, the assessment of whether child soldiers as purported victims of intraparty sexual violence are protected by international humanitarian law must take into account the particular circumstances surrounding the offenses at hand. The trial chamber, initially reluctant to address second jurisdictional challenge, but later directed to do so by the appeal chamber, reached a similar conclusion as the pre-trial chamber a bit drew a different line of reasoning. It turned that certain acts specified in the statute could constitute war crime if it's committed against individuals who don't co qualify as protected persons under the IHL framework. The chamber determined that since the enlistment, conscription, or use of children at the age of 15 constitute a great breach of IHL, the defender could not use their prior unlawful actions to evade criminal liability for subsequent alleged offenses. The trial chamber ruling was upheld by the appeal chamber, which also denied the defense claim that the, stat the statute of the ICC required the status requirement and confirmed jurisdiction over the desired offenses. The trial chamber further argued that due to the imperative nature of the privations against torture, genocide, and slavery, the, provision, the prohibition against rape, which can amount to torture and genocide, and sexual slavery, form of slavery, also hold to Scoggins' status. In this view, our team contends that sexual violence perpetrated against members of the same group falling within the category of rape amounted to torture makes it, makes it specific uh, peremptory norm falling under the jurisdiction of what, whichever international court or tribunal. Thus, we entrench their competence to prosecuting effectively charged crimes without explicit referral to interparty sexual violence in either the Rome Statutes or international humanitarian law. The appeal chamber came to the conclusion that expanding the scope of criminal liability of war crime was permitted under both the statute and the established framework of international law notwithstanding the fact that the session was unusual. Further, 
The Chamber's decision to maintain jurisdiction over sexual crimes committed within armed group highlights the importance of ensuring accountability for perpetrators, irrespective of their affiliations, irrespective of their affiliations. This ruling underscores a dedication to upholding justice and rule of law, all, all while maintaining fidelity to the principles of international law. The, the court continued, the interplay between framework rules of international humanitarian law and second rules generating international crimi criminal resp re re responsibility, responsibility presented a nuance and intact dynamic. While some argue for necessary correlation between individual criminal responsibility for war crimes and violation of IHL and violation underlying IHL rules, this perspective has faced crit criticism for its rest restrictive nature. Besides, and despite some support from state practice and first decisions of international criminal tribunals, recent rulings such as those in the Taganda case are prompted a revaluation of this stance. Indeed, relying solely on a breach of IHL or underlying IHL rules to establish international criminal responsibility forces significant challenges, particularly in cases involving intraparty actions as war crimes. The challenge is particularly salient in instances of interparty sexual violence, including acts perpetrated against sound changes. Although certain protections for children and additional protocol two may some recourse may, may, may some recourse navigating the complexities of their protection against intraparty sexual violence within armed groups remains a formidable task and the current IHL frameworks. Recent scholarly contributions have advocated for extending IHL rules to govern intraparty relations in non-international armed conflict, but in particular. These contributions maintain that the protection and the classification of conduct of war, war crimes and on objective conduct-based criteria rather than solely subjective-based ones. For instance, the 2016 ICRC commentary for the first Geneva Conventions suggests that while common Article 3 applies to relations within the same armed group, individuals must not be actively involved in hostilities or host the combat to qualify for, for, to qualify for protection and IHL. I will continue with analysis of command responsibility. According to the judgment, examined Taganda's command responsibility in great detail and found them legally liable for offenses, including self sexual assault committed by child soldiers under his command. This is standards included in sections of legal conclusions on command responsibility and Taganda function and command structure within the armed uh, group. The court went on the recognition of gravity of sexual violence, the ICC underlined the seriousness of sexual violence as a war crime and human rights violation through the proceeding. The court conclusion, conclusions regarding the nature of these offenses and the sections addressing the counts pertaining to sexual violence both make the acknowledgement clear. On victim, uh, uh, on victim centered approach, the International Criminal Court strategy in Taganda was under, underscored the need of victim centered approach to justice, acknowledging the right of sexual violence survivors to seek redress and compensation. The portion that addresses the court examination of victims' rights and appropriate remedies contained pertinent passages. On the rejection of impunity, the ICC firmly condemned impunity for just disgusting conduct by guaranteeing Taganda's account accountability for sexual abuse and other crime. This is an atti attitude that permits the entire ruling, capacity, uh, especially the part that explores the legal con con conclusions and certain guidelines related to sexual assault. Thank you, members of the panel, and this concludes my presentation. Thank you so much, Felix, for your speech. Now I would like to call on Mr. Anifio Ini Ukpung as the second speaker of the opposition team to further the debate for his team. Thank you. My name is Anifio Ini. I am the second speaker for the opposition team. And we are here to oppose the motion that if the ICC and other tribunals prosecute sexual violence, Perpetrated against child soldiers by members of their own group, it will clash with the provisions of IHL. Firstly, I will be emphasizing on the applicabilities of law in the course of the interpretation of the Rome Statutes. 
Now, the primary facial legal framework that should be used in the course of the interpretation of the Rome Statutes should be done in light of the provisions of the IHO. Now, it is very pertinent to note that this position of the law is statutorily embedded in Article 21, Paragraph B of the Rome Statutes. Now, it provides that the courts must, where appropriate, use applicable laws and treaties, international laws, and also establish principle of rules of international laws of armed conflicts. Now, it is obvious and it is in no doubt that in a situation where it involves armed conflicts, the relevant legal framework that should be applicable in the course of the interpretation of that statute is the provisions of IHL. Now, what's the standpoint of this argument? The standpoint of this argument is to avoid inconsistencies in the course of the interpretations of the provisions of the Rome Statute. And also other legal relevant framework and treaties that should be used in the course of the interpretation of the Rome Statute are the Geneva Convention and also other additional protocols. Now, it will interest you to note that the drafters and the, the, the intendment of the drafters of the Geneva Convention and other additional protocols did not in any way envisage the protection of members of the same group. And like I said earlier, in the course of the interpretation of the provisions of the Rome Statute, it must be done in light of the provisions of IHO, particularly where it involves an armed conflict situation. Now, looking at Article 8 of the Rome Statute, which talks about war crime, now it is very pertinent to note that the crime enlisted in that provision is basically a violation of the provisions of IHL and also a grief breaches of the Geneva Convention and the additional protocol. And that is why I say that it must be interpreted in light of the provision of IHL. Like the first speaker has already established, IHL only applies in situation where there is armed conflict either on the international character or non-international character. Now it's very important to note that the provisions of IHL did not envisage the protection of sexual violence perpetrated against child soldiers by members of their own group. And this simply means that it is not the crime within the purview of the provision of IHL. And this must be taken into consideration in respect to Article 8 of the Rome Statute. Moving further, it is pertinent to note that the provision of IHL and also the provision of the ICC Statute tilt towards the protection of certain categories of persons. Who are these persons? Now, it's interesting to know that this particular argument has two prongs. The first is that the provisions of IHL tilts towards the protections of individuals from the hands of their enemies. And also the intentment of the drafters of the Geneva Convention and also other additional protocol did not envisage, like I said earlier, towards the protection of members by their own group. And moving further, it's very pertinent to note that the only exception to this rule is that if these individuals are wounded persons or they are sick persons, that is when they will enjoy the benefits of the protections of the provisions of IHO. The second prong of this argument is that the provision of IHO intends towards the protections of persons who are no longer engaged in direct participation of hostilities. Now, the commentary of Common Article 3 of the Geneva Convention has expressly emphasized on that point. This protection are directed to persons who encompasses the civilian populations, the, the, the people who are sick and people who are wounded, and also military personnel who are no longer engaged in armed conflicts. Moving further, I'll be emphasizing on the jurisdiction of the ICC. What is the jurisdiction of the courts? Now, the jurisdiction of every court is the clothed authority to exercise adjudicatory power over a particular subject matter or a criminal activities. Now, it's interesting to know that the rationale for the specifying of the jurisdiction of ICC is basically to uphold the principle of legality. And the principle of legality has been one of the most venerated principles in regards to criminal law, which has found expression in international criminal law. Now, looking at the jurisdiction of ICC, the court, the ICC has several jurisdiction in respect to certain crimes, and this encompasses crime of genocide, crime of aggression, crime against humanity, and war crimes. These are the crimes within the ambit of the jurisdiction of ICC. But our emphasis here will be laid on war crimes because it is a crime that was committed during an armed conflict. Now moving further, 
like I say, the principle of legality, what is the effect of this principle? That the effect of this principle is that no person shall be criminally responsible for a conduct or an act which did not constitute a crime at the time it takes place. Now, since the provision of IHL did not consider sexual violence perpetrated against child soldiers as a crime within its ambit, then the ICC lacks jurisdiction in respect to such criminal activities. Like I said, this principle of legality has been crystallized into two Latin maxims, first, which is the non crime sine lege and the nulle pone sine lege. Like I said, no person shall be criminally responsible for an act which did not constitute a crime at the time it takes place. Now, the IHL provision does not consider sexual violence that is being perpetrated against child soldiers by members of their own group as a crime within the provisions of the Rome Statute. And if the ICC goes ahead to prosecute such criminal activities, then there will be a definite clash with the provisions of IHL. And moving further, it will be very interesting to note that this principle of legality is anchored statutorily in Article 22, Paragraph 1 of the Rome Statute. Furthermore, I'll be emphasizing on the rule of ambiguity. This rule of ambiguity is established in Article 22, Paragraph 2 of the Rome Statute. Now, what is the effect of this rule? The effect of this rule is that in the course of the definition of crime, it shall be construed strictly, emphasis, it shall be construed strictly and shall not be extended by an analogy. And in the case of ambiguity, it shall be defined in favor of an accused person, convicted person, or the investigated person. Now, it is very pertinent to note that this rule of ambiguity has been reflected upon in the Lubanga case, where the accused who was charged for the conscription of, child of children into armed conflict was convicted on that basis. The court did not extend such criminal activities to cover sexual violence perpetrated against child soldiers by members of their own group. It is to this extent that the judgment and the approach, which is obviously the technological approach adopted in the Intanganda case, should highly not be adopted in this instance matter, because it is not only a deviation from and violation of the Article 22, Paragraph 2 of the Rome Statute, but also a violation of a long-standing principle of legality and a deviation from that principle, which also go to an extent of contaminating the long-standing principle of legality. Now, it is very interesting to note that we are not here to advocate for the promotion of sexual violence to be treated against child soldiers. But what we are trying to say is that the ICC and other international tribunal is not the right court to exercise jurisdiction over such criminal matters. The best thing and the best court to prosecute such um, sexual violence perpetrated against child soldiers is the municipal court of the country where this criminal activities was conducted. And if the ICC and other international tribunal goes ahead to prosecute sexual violence perpetrated against child soldiers by members of their own group, it will definitely clash with the provisions of IHO. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ukpon, for the Triviton speech. And we are nearing towards the end of the debate. It has been a very interesting and cool discussion so far. Right now, I'm calling the last speaker of the proposition team. Miss Emily Brown to finish the position of her team. Emily, please. Yes, hello. Thank you, Miss Tatiana. Hello, everyone. My name is Emily, and I am a legal researcher within the sexual violence team. And today I will be presenting the proposition team's rebuttal in this debate. In responding to the arguments presented by the opposition, the proposition team reaffirms its position on the effectiveness of the international criminal courts and tribunals in prosecuting sexual violence against child soldiers while upholding the principles of international humanitarian law. Let us address each point raised by the opposition with a comprehensive rebuttal that further solidifies our stance. The opposition argues that international humanitarian law is mainly concerned with protecting individuals from enemy forces rather than from members of their own group. Therefore, they question the relevance of international legal protections to crimes committed against child soldiers by their own group members. Although international humanitarian law has traditionally focused on regulating the conduct of parties to a conflict, it is essential to recognize that this framework has evolved to cover violations committed by all parties involved in armed conflict, including intra-group crimes. 
Expanding on the defense argument in the Antagonda case, let us examine the broader legal landscape. The International C Criminal Court consistently upholds that all individuals, including child soldiers, are entitled to protection under international humanitarian law, regardless of their affiliation with an armed group. For instance, in the Labanga case, the ICC affirmed that child soldiers, irrespective of their status as combatants, should receive special protection under international law. This highlights the responsibility of all parties to respect and uphold these rights. Moreover, the Rome Statute explicitly recognizes the conscription and use of child soldiers as war crimes under Article 2, Section B, Section 2, uh, sorry, Article 8, Section 2, B26, underscoring the international community's unequivocal condemnation of such practices. By prosecuting individuals like Bosco and Tagana for crimes committed against child soldiers within their own ranks, the international criminal courts and tribunals uphold the principles of international humanitarian law and send a clear message that violations against vulnerable individuals will not go unpunished. Furthermore, it is essential to challenge the notion that child soldiers can be viewed solely as combatants. While some may argue that child soldiers willingly participate in armed conflict, the reality is far more complex. Many children are coerced, abducted, or manipulated by adults into joining armed groups, often subjected to indoctrination and exploitation. Recognizing the unique vulnerability of child soldiers and affirming their right to protection under international law is not only a legal imperative, but also a moral obligation. Moving on to the broader implications of prosecuting sexual violence against child soldiers, let us consider the societal impact of these efforts. Beyond the courtroom, international criminal courts and tribunals play a pivotal role in amplifying the voices of survivors. Dismantling cycles of violence and fostering re reconciliation in conflict-affected communities. By upholding perpetrators accountable for their actions, international criminal courts and tribunals contribute to the restoration of dignity and the prevention of future atrocities. Moreover, the principle of complementarity underscores the collaborative approach between international criminal courts and tribunals and national authorities in prosecuting crimes against child soldiers. While international criminal courts and tribunals serve as a last resort, their partnership with domestic courts is critical in ensuring that justice is not only served, but also localized and, sustain and sustainable. Capacity building initiatives, resource allocation, and institutional reforms are essential to strengthening the national legal system's ability to effectively handle cases involving child soldiers. In conclusion, the proposition team reiterates international criminal courts and tribunals' competence in prosecuting sexual violence against child soldiers within their own ranks while upholding the principles of international humanitarian law. By recognizing the vulnerability of child soldiers and affirming their right to protection under international law, international criminal courts and tribunals play a crucial role in promoting justice, accountability, and the prevention of future atro atrocities. Thank you. That was the rebuttal for the proposi proposition team. And I will now pass the floor back to our moderator, Ms. Tatiana. Thank you, Emily, for delivering your team's final position. We have now come to the very last speaker for today's debate. I would like to call the third and the final speaker of the opposition team, Mr. Wakmofon Friday Ntia, to conclude the debate for his team. Please. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Wang Fon Ntia, the third speaker on the opposition team in today's debate. We vehemently retain the position that international criminal courts and tribunals cannot effectively prosecute the sexual violence perpetrated against child soldiers by members of their own group. Please let me rebut some claims made by my esteemed opponent. To the claim that sexual violence perpetrated against child soldiers by members of their own group can be effectively prosecuted by the international criminal courts and tribunals, we submit that there is no provision for the war crimes of sexual violence perpetrated against child soldiers by members of their own group. It is a basic assumption of international criminal law that for an act to constitute a war crime, it must be a violation of international humanitarian law. International 
international criminal statutes support this position. For example, Article 6B of the London Charter criminalizes war crimes, namely the violations of the laws or customs of war. Article 3 of the International Criminal Tribunal of the former Yugoslavia posits that the International Criminal the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia shall be can prosecute persons violating the laws or custom of wars. In each and every case, every act that constitutes war crime must be a violation of international humanitarian law. Therefore, the International Criminal Courts and Tribunals cannot effectively prosecute the sexual violence perpetrated against child soldiers by members of their own group in this case. So they claim that members of the same group are protected from sexual violence committed by their own group. We posit that generally international humanitarian law does not cover member against member violence. However, under the first and second Geneva Conventions, member against member violence violates international humanitarian law only when the victim of such violence is hold the combat. That is to say that the victim must either be sick, bruised, or shipwrecked. In the event where the victim is none of these, such violence may well constitute a state's national criminal law, but it does not violate international humanitarian law. We therefore reiterate our position as oppositions that international criminal courts and tribunals cannot effectively prosecute this sexual violence perpetrated against child soldiers by members of their own group. So they claim that, so they claim that sexual violence is always a crime and thus international humanitarian law does not clash with such prosecution. We submit earlier explained by my colleagues, only protects protected person. By this, Article 8 of the Rome Statute posits grave breaches of the Geneva Conventions and all other relevant statutes do not go on to state the position of child soldiers, of child soldiers and combatants on the same group as that of protected persons. Also, these child soldiers assume the position or assume a continuous combat function during their subsistence in, in, in armed group, during their subsistence and membership in armed groups. And as earlier posited by my colleagues, international humanitarian law do not protect those taking active participation in the hostilities. Therefore, we submit that the International Criminal Courts and Tribunals cannot effectively prosecute the sexual violence perpetrated against child soldiers by members of their own group. Accepting that, the, that, that sexual violence is a crime and thus international humanitarian law does not interfere with such prosecution where individuals belong to the same group would mean that we are interpreting international humanitarian law in the light of human rights law. It is necessary to state that international humanitarian law is the lex special law suffices during all situations. International humanitarian law restricts itself to only situations of armed conflict. K.J. Patch in his work, Humanitarian, humanitarian Law and Human Rights Law, explained that traditionally human rights law exists to, to, to human rights law exists to ensure the relation to ensure the smooth relationship between nationals and the state, whereas humanitarian law exists during armed conflict to protect belligerents and the nationals of a state. Therefore, we posit that during the situations of armed conflict, international humanitarian law should suffice. By this, international humanitarian law does not provide for the sexual violence perpetrated against child soldiers by members of their own group. And we reiterate our position that the international criminal courts and tribunals cannot effectively prosecute these offenses. So they claim that international criminal courts and tribunals can effectively prosecute sexual offenses perpetrated against child soldiers by members of their own group. 
we wish to clarify, we wish to state that this sexual violence do not even come under the jurisdiction of international criminal courts and tribunals. And this was earlier, earlier stated by my colleague. We are not, we are not denying the fact that international, we are, we are not denying the fact that sexual violence is a crime and must be prosecuted. However, we posit that these crimes constitute and these crimes constitute a state's domestic national state's domestic criminal law and therefore must be prosecuted or must be subjected to adjudication by the municipal courts the national judges will better be will be will better will be better fitted to handle these matters and therefore we submit that the right thing to do would be to to subject these offenses to adjudication and prosecution by the municipal courts. Finally, the proposition's position in today's debate goes to reiterate their willingness to rely on a teleological reasoning where the Rome Statute do not protect victims of sexual violence perpetrated against child soldiers by members of their own group as much as they think it should. No one is in favor of sexually of raping and sexually enslaving child soldiers, but the solution isn't to detach the laws of war crime itself from its moorings in international humanitarian law by holding, if only implicitly, that an act can constitute a war crime even when it does not violate a rule of the international humanitarian law. To do so would be legally indefensible. It would risk delegitimizing the international criminal courts and tribunals and the laws of war crimes itself. In conclusion, we retain our position that we oppose the motion that international criminal courts and tribunals can effectively prosecute the sexual violence perpetrated against child soldiers by members of their own group. And beyond the court's room, as earlier expressed by the third speaker on the other part, on the other side, beyond the court room is jungle justice. And we do not want that. By way of conclusion, we posit and we submit vehemently that the International Criminal Courts and Tribunals cannot effectively prosecute the sexual violence perpetrated against child soldiers by members of their own group. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ntia, for your sound final speech. And this concludes the debate part of today's session. I'm now asking the judges to leave the session room and to enter a separate call to reflect on the debate. Uh, for our audience and for all the participants, you can take a 15 minutes break until 5.20. Uh, uh, for now, we'll only play some videos of the Center for African Justice, uh, Matinza Educational Project. Thank you so much. we want to say that all of them have done very well. And if you look at the criteria that we are using to judge this okay, uh, debate, we are not looking for correctness, space, like this is this protects this or that, but we are looking for persuasion, legal argument, using the law, convincing us, using finding the ethos, right? like trying to convince us, even if that is not what it is, but the convincing, the eloquence, the uh, the the the, the uh, conclusions and structure, everything we considered all of those things. Um, I'm happy to say that we think uh, we are much more persuaded by the opposing theme, even though the proposition did very well, and we have actually recognize how much effort Emily has put in. I'm not saying the rest didn't do well. 
you've all done very well. But uh, of course, she 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 made some serious inputs that were trying to tilt over the the uh, <laughs> the the ball to the other side to their side. But then the sorry the proposition the opposing team uh, used a lot of cases like persuading us they have done so much more. I can't count all the good things they have done. And I want to say congratulations to them. They have done very well. Um, this is just a practice. No one loses in this. It's not like a loss. It's a practice we are all trying to learn. And we will give the verdict to the, the op opposing team. I hope you hear me. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Afrim Nar, for giving your feedback. Yes, so, so can we give them. some applause to them and, and recognize them? <laughs> Secondly, we have also deliberated on the person to give the best speaker. Um, the best speaker. Um, um, I don't know if I got the name right, but if I don't get it right, please forgive me. The, the, the third person in the opposing team is it is Uku, 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 Uku. What's the name? If you can remind me, please. Okay, the correct pronunciation of the name is Wakunfon. Wakunfon Intia. Yes, Intia. Yeah, the judges decide to give the best speaker to to him in fact we recognize that the whole team they they were very eloquent they, they were in terms of structure and everything they were very good probably we should have said all of them but i want to say we just have to pick one of them and uh, Ukwa, uh, Ukwa, um, India. Uh, we, we we want to recognize him for that like i said earlier there are um few others in both teams that have done so many good things and we, we cannot just mention everything. But I want to thank you for this. My general feedback is that the, the debate has been very successful. I was so impressed. If I should debate myself, I would have gone some direction or this, but we are all learning. So thank you very much for, for your efforts. And I thank the African Center for justice and human rights, for organizing this, and I hope we will continue to do it again. Um, my judges, have I represented us? I'm not hearing anyone. Yes. Have I represented yes. us? Yes, very good. Very good. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I think without much from myself, I will hand over to Tatiana to continue with the process. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Afrim Nar, uh, for your uh, judgment, for your opinion. And I would also ask other judges, Ms. Uh, Irene Di Valvasoni, uh, Judge Barrister, Ms. Chikanane, Judge Ms. Chidi Grace Obeke, and Judge Ms. Saskia Hayes, to say a few words about our students, about the debate. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Yeah, I'd like to say that um, it's a very big um, honor for me to be here. And I want to really thank the Center for African Justice and Human Rights, um, the founder, especially Ms. Sophia Ubu, for this opportunity. I believe that if more will take us, especially between international students of international law, it will go a, a long way in. Uh, fostering what it had in mind, the United Nations, actually. Um, debates on international law help undergraduates, help graduates, researchers. Uh, it helps with critical thinking. It helps with understanding global issues. It helps with sharpening legal skills and developments. Uh, it helps also to pro promote diplomacy, negotiations, awareness of diversity and inclusion. And I'd like to thank all the people that um, saw that this uh, was successful, all the judges and all the participants, all the debaters as well. 
And I hope that more engagements like this will be taking place in the future to foster international growth. Thank you. Thank um, you so much. Uh, does anyone else uh, want to add something? Okay. Um, I, I would like to congratulate the African Center and especially Sophia, which has been a great friend of mine, um, projecting and supporting the development of international criminal justice and jurisprudence, both internationally and in Nigeria. The center has been doing an amazing work. Um, I would like to congratulate the debaters um, and every person who took time to participate in this, the uh, lead judge, and other judges. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. It's an honor, in fact. Um, and the students, as you continue in your journey to achieving your degree, I would like to really appreciate what you have done already. Coming into the legal studies, legal profession is not a is is a is not a is not to be taken for granted. Just continue to do what you are doing. Be consistent. Study is good for you to really do well academically. If you intend to go into the international legal space, it's very competitive, but it's also rewarding. Um, so I encourage all of us to continue to do what the bit we can do to ensure that there's justice in our respective countries and internationally. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your kind words. I'll be quick. Sure. Okay. First and foremost, thank you uh, to the Center for African Justice, uh, Peace and Human Rights for organizing the debate. And really congratulations to all the speakers. I'm very impressed with their speeches, uh, considering also that the topic uh, was indeed very complex. Uh, and uh, so really congratulations to all of you. Um, just shortly, I think uh, what we can learn from this uh, exercise is that uh, um, sometimes uh, uh, even if the, the legal, we have some more stronger legal reasoning uh, and uh, uh, th there, is a, th there is no confusion of, of which is uh, on paper um, the most, uh, the, the stronger legal reasoning. Sometimes uh, the way um, legal arguments are presented uh, makes the difference. Uh, so in this case, uh, what we can learn is that uh, it's really, really important uh, to improve uh, public speaking. Uh, and uh, this is uh, the, the scope of this uh, exercise uh, organized by the Center for African Justice. Uh, so uh, thank you very much uh, again uh, to Sofia and uh, to the Center for African Justice, Peace and Human Rights. Thank you so much, Ms. Tivalvasoni. Thank you all the judges for uh, today's session and for giving your feedback, your words of motivation. It's very important for all of us. At this point, I want to thank again all the judges for the wise remarks and their practical guidance. We have now concluded our event. We appreciate everyone who has been watching and stayed with us until the very end. We hope the event was both informative and entertaining for you. Uh, in addition, I want to express my gratitude to our audience from all over the world, the judges, the timekeeper, the coaches, the debaters, technical team, the board members of the Center for African Justice. All of you ensured the smooth and pleasant process of the debate, and the Center is grateful for your contribution. Also, special thanks goes to the Dean of the Faculty of Law of the University of Uyo, Professor Moisola Essin. We thank you for making your students available to participate in the debate, and we really hope to continue to collaborate with your university in other events and occasions. Uh, before we conclude, it's very important to uh, say special regards and words of appreciation to the founder of the Center for African Justice, Ms. Sophia Ugu. And right now, I want to uh, give a floor to my colleague, uh, to express all our gratitude to Ms. Sophia Ugu for her support and guidance. Please, Ms. Anupama, the floor is yours. 
Thank you, Tatiana. Uh, I would like to say something about uh, Ms. Sophia. Uh, your leadership as a chairperson of the CAJPS are, has been truly remarkable. Your dedication and hard work you propelled our team to achieve great success. On behalf of our entire team, I want to express our sincere gratitude for your guidance and support. Thank you for all you do for us. And I would like to say, I would like uh, Sophia to say something uh, about this debate and everyone. And this, I will hand over to the Miss Sophia. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone, um, for your kind words. Uh, before I say anything, I would want to invite uh distinguished and most honorable secretary, Ms. Adesola Adeboyojo, who is here with us, to so, um please take the floor and say a few words. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Sophia Ugu for giving me the floor. I wanted to say also a very big thank you to the participants, to the students, uh, the opposition and proposition teams for the excellent work that they have done. I wanted to say thank you also to uh, all the judges and uh, to Professor Noel Kenive for her tireless efforts. I hope I pronounced that properly, Professor uh, Kinive, uh, for your tireless efforts in preparing both teams for um, this debate, which has been very exciting. I'm sorry I joined uh, a little late. I was in another meeting. Uh, I want to um, give a special recognition and thanks to the judges, to Dr. Ibrahim Afrim Naha, to uh, Miss Chika Nana, Judge Chika Nana, thank you very much. To Judge Irene De Valvasone, thank you very much. Uh, to Miss Saska Hayes, thank you very much. To Dr. Chidi Grace Obeke, Judge Chidi, thank you all very much for being part of this. And last but certainly not the least, I want to express uh, the special thanks uh, to Professor Mujisola Esenyi, who is the uh, Dean of the Faculty of Law. I'm sure you're very proud of your students. They've, they've done a, an amazing uh, work. And I believe that uh, this kind of international cooperation that we've seen uh, has actually uh, been part of what we want to see more uh, in terms of collaboration between uh, Nigerian universities and international uh, centers of excellence or justice. So without further ado, I would uh, hand over to uh, the in, indefatigable Ms. Sophia Ugu, who has done such a wonderful and excellent job in putting this together. Ms. Ugu, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ma. And thank you to everyone. Um, our gratitude can never be so um, much in excess. We are very grateful to everyone who participated in this debate. The um, debaters, it took us a long journey to be here today. So we thank you for investing your time and um, resources in making this happen. We appreciate our coach, Professor Noel Quinnett, um, for all her efforts. Not everyone could be as uh, patient as uh, you. You did an amazing job in um, working with the students at their own pace and grooming them for this, despite all the hitches and challenges and setbacks that we experienced. Thank you so much for your commitment uh, to this uh, project. And thank you for wanting to share your knowledge, your wealth of knowledge. Um, you all can research her to know more about her and who she really is. But despite all the hearts and all her achievements, she's still for a level in every sense and get them ready for this very great day. Thank you.
And I want to also extend my thanks to the judges for your time uh, and collaboration over the years and um, also for this particular event. Thank you. We do not take it for granted. Thank you to um, the winners of this debate. Uh, special thanks to all the speakers, all the debaters, but um, particularly um, the winners of this uh, debate. It's not easy to compete against uh, international students. Um, we we saw what happened with the internet connections and all those things that we we discussed during one of our practice sessions we envisaged so when you have a very good debater eloquently arguing his points you have um the internet or electricity going off it could disorganize the speaker but despite that we saw how this speaker remained resilient and composed till the end of the argument. So special thanks also to the first speaker for all his efforts. Um, we appreciate that. Uh, for, for winning uh, this debate, I would want to announce that the Board and Management of Center for African Justice, Peace and Human Rights have decided to offer a little gifts to the University of Uyo. Um, we don't do this normally, but uh, we, we decided that we present something very little to you just to motivate you and to continue to enhance your knowledge in international criminal law. So I hope that this is well received and I hope that this is the beginning of many more collaborations with your university. And um, I also hope that this is the beginning of many more collaborations uh, with everyone here, because together we can make a better society and a better world. So we don't have to take what we are doing for granted. Thank you for your little efforts. Thank you for your great efforts. Thank you for everything. We appreciate it. Thank you. I would at this point hand over the uh, platform to the moderator. Uh, thank you, Ms. Ugu, for your words of motivation. And lastly, before we conclude today's meeting, I respectfully ask you to follow our social media pages like LinkedIn or Instagram before you leave today's session. All the links to our social media are available under the session, under the live stream. Um, and that's all, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you for today's participation. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. 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 See you again. Yes. Thank you and goodbye. Bye.